Welcome. Thank you very much for coming to our talk. Um, we hope we're going to give you some insights today. Um, on the stage, uh, I'm Marcus, um, and that's Florian. Hello, Florian. Hi. Uh, we're working for Mobility. I'm working for Mobility. Florian is working for Innovex. And as we've been introduced, we're going to talk a bit about personalization. Um, we're going to start with a more general introduction. Who are we? Why are we here? Why do we want to give a talk for, for you at PyData? Um, digging into uh, personalization use cases we have at Mobility.de, digging even further and like uh, showing you one example of um, a personalization approach, which is predicting a car buying intent of our users. And um, then we go more to the technical side. That's actually going to be presented by Florian. Uh, Python for big data processing. So how do we approach this on our side using Python and then optimizing performance? All right, um, just as an introduction for those of you uh, who don't know, Mobility is uh, a German website where you can uh, buy cars. We have uh, new cars and uh, used cars, car dealers, so this is the general um, company we're, we're working for. Um, we're all part of eBay Tech, so Mobility belongs to eBay Tech. Uh, we're also eBay Kleinanzeigen, for example, belongs to, um, it's actually quite broad, it's also in other countries, Gumtree, um, Kijiji, and uh, Marktplatz. Um, to say a bit about mobility, it's the biggest uh, car market online in Germany. We have around 13.5 uh, million unique users uh, per month and around 1.6 million vehicles on our site every day. Um, we're split between two locations in Berlin. One is uh, the most of us are like situated in uh, close to Wannsee, it's called Dreilinden. And then we have another headquarter in Friedrichshain. Um, uh, talking about data, so just that you have a rough estimate uh, what uh, how data looks for us. We have uh, around 50 million search events per day, 40 million uh, individual view events, so like people looking at individual listings to our cars, 1 million parking events. Parking for us is what you in other websites call wish listing, so you put something on your wish, wish list because it's cars, parking was uh, a nicer name. I told you about 1.5, uh, 1.6 million listings, um, and around 800,000 times a day, uh, any of those listings are changed uh, by our dealers, and a lot of like contacts to our dealers. So this is what we have to deal uh, with pretty much on an everyday basis. If I say we, it's actually not just the two of us. <laughs> um, there are a number of people here, so this is even just a subfraction of all the people that uh, work together with us. Uh, it's a very nice team uh, of data scientists, data engineers. We have back-end developers, front-end developers. We have people working in data products. Uh, it's a very, very nice mix uh, mixture. We actually don't always dress uh, like that. That was for a Christmas party, and we had a Game of Thrones-themed uh, presentation, so that was how this uh, came into being. So, yeah, yeah short word about uh, Innovex. We are an IT project house. We have been supporting uh, Mobile in this combined endeavor for more than three years, and uh, yeah, still are building cool data products with them. And uh, we have offices in Karlsruhe, Cologne, Munich, Pforzheim, Hamburg, and Stuttgart. And besides data science and data engineering, we also do operations and app development and uh, trainings. All right. So why do we want to talk about personalization? I uh, like to use this example. It's what in German is called a Tante Emma Laden. English translation would be probably Aunt Emma's little store or something like this. So if you go to any of those stores, what you usually see uh, is a lot of products, so you get inspiration of what you want to buy. And uh, you might uh, even get engaged by some things you maybe didn't expect it to find, but are very interesting, and you might even want to come back just for exactly that. Um, this is Aunt Emma. She's a really nice aunt, and uh, she's always very friendly, even to customers that never been to her store. Um, of course, first time she, you come in, she probably doesn't know your name. You've never been there. She's just, she's going to treat you as a random person. Um, well, actually, you liked on, uh, Aunt Emma's store, so therefore you're coming back. It's a nice store. Why not coming back? And you're coming back and back. Uh, she remembers you maybe already at the second time, and she's like, ah, oh, yeah, you've been here. You bought, I don't know, beans, whatever, milk. Um, and maybe you even become a regular. So she's going to like greet you. You're coming into a store every day. And of course, just imagine Ta Aunt Emma would treat you every day the same way she did the first day. For me, that would be very, uh, I, I would be very unhappy about this because yes, I'm unique. I'm me. So therefore, if I come back to Ta Aunt Emma's store, I want to be treated as me. I want it to be treated in a personalized way. And that's exactly 
what personalization does on the internet. Um, that's, that something like this works has been shown a number of times. So I guess you all know the Facebook news feed, which is your news feed. You're not seeing like the news feed of everyone else. Uh, Pinterest uh, gives you discovery of pictures you might be interested in. Spotify is giving very personalized um, music recommendation and very similar is uh, Netflix. Uh, why do people do that? Well, as I said, first it drives user experience. Like we all feel treated as who we are individually and also it engages users to your website. Um, how do we do that at Mobility? When uh, a user interacts with our website, uh, we track those events and store them in a Hadoop ecosystem. And then uh, we have, in general, two uh, approaches to personalization. One we call a preference. So um, if a user comes to our website, we are thinking about what are your car preferences, and we're making anonymized profiles out of this. We uh, assemble them over multiple days. And we, for example, use them to give you recommendations which are very specific for you. The, our other approach to, uh, um, to uh, personalization is what we call user interactions or also user intents. So you're interacting with our website um, on a specific time of day. Um, you have a specific idea. Again, we assemble this over uh, a number of days. And then we use it, for example, for segmentation or what I always uh, call user intent modeling. Um, as a first example, we're going to go this route just to tell you a bit about this. Um, so this is the uh, anonymized user preferences. Let's, for example, say that user is uh, into used cars, not, used car, uh, not new cars. Um, he's uh, split between two uh, German makes, BMW and Audi. And then even we, we drill down deeper saying, okay, what are the individual models you're into? Um, what's your radius of search? What's the area you would actually drive to a dealer to uh, find a car? Um, what's the preferred price range you're uh, looking for? And what's your mileage? Uh, we define those based on different interactions because different interactions with the websites show how much you're um, caring for a specific car. So do you made a view? Did you put it on your wish list? Did you made a contact to that? Um, we have a certain a modeling approach for uncertainty. I'm not going to go too much into details. Actually, Florian and all our colleague Arnab uh, showed this last year on PyData. It's been recorded. So if you're interested in recommendation, uh, it's worth checking out. Um, I just roughly tell you what we do. We use a Bayesian approach to model uh, uncertainty. Uh, might be that you've just been here the first time and we still want to give, give you some recommendations, right? So therefore, we use the Bayesian approach and an idea of a prior which we generate over all the users we have on our website. And uh, when you come initially to our website, you, you're treated as that prior. You interact more and more and more. Uh, you generate more events with our website and therefore at some point, you is you. Um, and is treated as such. Um, and um, then this is how our uh, recommendation engine works. It's been recently updated uh, to a deep uh, recommendation engine using TensorFlow. Uh, also, that one has been presented at the buzzword by our colleague uh, Igor Mazor. Uh, again, worth checking out. So how does it work in general? We have an idea of the rough uh, feature space we have uh, of cars. So we're representing cars as numbers. Um, we have a collaborative information approach. That's the, the classical people who, all, who searched for this also search for that, this kind of thing. Um, we have the user preferences I told you before, and we put this all through our recommendation engine. And then we rate in the, all of our listings specifically for that individual user and give recommendations based on that. Um, that's one of the approaches. That's this part. I went here. Let's go to the other side, user intent. Um, so that you have an idea, I give you uh, some examples what that means. Let's assume that guy here, he actually buys the car, uh, his first car ever. He has no idea uh, what should a car cost, what actually kind of car do I need. So um, the intent here is you need a lot of information and you need guidance. That's a very specific uh, thing. Uh, let's, let's go for her. She's a total expert knows everything about cars. She wants to have the perfect deal in the fastest way, going to the website, spend two days, and like have the new car running. Um, that guy, he really loves cars, but he actually doesn't buy the cars so often. Maybe other people buy them for him. I don't know. Uh, so he browses for mostly expensive cars, but actually he doesn't want to go to a dealer in the end. 
And then there's this guy, it's an actual car dealer. He uses our website to find out about his, um, uh, the people that uh, also sell cars. What is their price range? What kind of cars do they have in the market right now? What should, how, how much should he, does he get for individual cars? So if you look at those four people, actually their intents are very different. And like making one website, which is giving you the perfect experience for all of them is really hard. So the idea is personalize it, put, uh, make differences between those people. To understand what's your intent, we always go for something we call a car buying journey. That's very different things. Also, um, let's, let's, for us, actually, it's quite simple. It's based on data. So it's a data car buying journey that are individual events. I told you about them. It's like making contacts, you park a car, you make a view, you make searches. And this is over a timeline. So here are a lot of interactions. There is less. Maybe you had some like days off. Here's more. This is the kind of data we look at. Um, and we were interested, how does that look like? So we uh, got around 4,000 uh, buyers we uh, had on our website and said, okay, let's look at their individual car buying, data car buying journeys. Um, we got some controls, randomly picked um, users, and we assembled around 75 million uh, interactions for those users. And I'm first going to give you a bit of like, uh, what does the data look like? What could we learn from looking at those um, events? Um, this here are some graphs. I'm going to explain them so it's not too hard. Uh, zero on the y-axis always means this is the first time we ever saw you, and one is like this is the last day you have been on our website. And on the y-axis here, you have different events. For example, make a contact. Um, the darker line is the, our buyer group, and the lighter line is our control group. So in this case, what you see is like the chance of making a contact is increasing to the end. Well, that's probably what you all get because car buying takes quite a lot of time. So usually like initially you're more into like uh, the information gathering stage and in the end you want to make a contact to your dealer because you actually want to get your car running, right? So um, it increases quite a lot for buyers. It also increases for control, but not as uh, dramatically. Um, if you go for the parking, parking was much more flat and actually increased much more for the control group. Um, interesting uh, example is the amount of cars you're actually viewing. That stays pretty much uh, the same over your whole car journey. So you're constantly generating the same amount of cars you're looking at. Um, and searches are actually going down. So the amount of different searches you're doing is, uh, is reduced. Because in the end, it's more like you already have all the cars you're interested in. You just want to make comparison, look at them individually. Um, that was something interesting for me, the amount of duplicated views. So how often do you look at a car you've already seen? Um, I don't know whoever did buy a car online, but that's actually something I also did that in the end, I always just like open all the same cars again and look at them again because you really want to make sure. So this is this kind of behavior. We see that our buyers like uh, top from like around 30% of duplicate car views to always half of the listings you see are you actually seen already. Um, that's also true with the control group, but not uh, as dramatic. Um, and then the uh, question I found interesting, when do people actually interact with a car they're going to uh, buy in the end? And what you see is that around like 70, 80% uh, in your car journey, this is where you interact the most with the car you bought in the end. And then in the end, it goes down again. A best explanation for this is that people just before they buy a car are like getting a bit like, mm, maybe I get the wrong one. So you're like starting a, a more broader search again, but then often coming back to the car you already made the decision for. Um, this kind of analysis uh, were very promising to us. So we said like maybe we can use these kind of things in a machine learning approach to predict that you want to buy a car today. That this is, um, so this is exactly what we wanted to do, predict that. Um, what can you do with it? It's for a personalization approach because when you want to buy a car, what's really important for you is that you can make comparisons between cars and you can make a contact very easily. So a nice thing would be to highlight the dealer context then more clearly um, and also provide you with car buying assistance in case, for example, you need a financing or whatever, it's, which is not that unusual, honestly, if you buy a car. So we put that into a machine learning approach and that's how it looked like. Um, we uh, generated a number of features. You have your buying date. We took the last 30 days in your uh, journey, and we generated the features, the individual events you had, um, the distribution of those events between each other, um, how uh, many days you have been active over the last 30 days, and some additional features, which were the amount of views versus searches that actually came out very predictive in one of our analysis, 
and the amount of duplicated views, which I showed you before. We didn't just do this over the 30 days, but we actually also defined windows. So in this example, it's like, okay, the last th three days of your interaction, the week before, and the 20 days before. Um, and then we even we computed ratios between those because this is like your, what, what's changed, right? So you already see that's quite uh, a number of uh, parameters in that model. So how did we went forward? Um, we used a logistic regression approach for this one. Um, given that the number of features is so big, actually, we needed uh, feature selection to prevent overfitting. So we started from different sub uh, subsections or selections of those features and uh, added or subtracted automatically based on Akeika information criterion and then coming up with different models. We even went one step forward. I told you that there were windows uh, that we had individual uh, features, so we also optimized that. That's how that looks like. We defined different windows and tried all of them out, did, put that into an optimization. What came out the, as the best was looking at your last day of interaction, looking at the week before, and looking at the three weeks before that. And you put this all into a machine learning model and you predict. Um, you do a cross, we did a cross validation 15 fold and a 70 30 train test split. And that's the best model that came out of that. So we reach an accuracy of predicting that you're going to buy the car uh, today or making this, this final call today by 70% um, with a sensitivity of around 68% uh, and a specificity of uh, 76%. That was really nice. We said like, oh, cool. So like, but this is today. Maybe we can also predict that you do this tomorrow or you do it in a week or in two. Um, well, what happened is, yeah, we were directly declining. So the more you go into the future, the higher it is predict. Damn humans, uh, we're actually changing our minds. <laughs> but it's <laughs> definitely a very interesting problem, and we're still on this. So if uh, anyone here in the audience uh, knows about this, I'm, I'm, we are very curious about learning more how you can actually uh, uh, progress more into the future with this. So like, it's not it's not bad, but you can definitely see that it's declining. So I told you about the big data part, and I'm going to hand over to uh, Florian because we're at PyData, so he's going to tell you something about Python. Yeah, so we've heard about the many interesting uh, use cases of some of the interesting use cases uh, that are at Mobile. Of course, there are many others. And uh, yeah, since we're on the PyData, of course, you're interested to see and to hear how Python, what kind of role does it play? Because Python as a language, you all know you have the global interpreter log, and a lot of things happen in memory, so the, the language itself um, is, is not really tailored for big data, but of course, yeah, you can do big data with it. And uh, we make a lot of use of the Hadoop ecosystem together with, um, with Python. So when I arrived like, like two and a half year ago, um, I started on the, working on the, on the data team at Mobile, and at that time, a lot of Hive was used. So um, who knows Hive of you? Just a short, oh, okay, many people know Hive. So it's really, it has been and still is kind of the uh, workhorse um, for doing big data. It's an Apache project. It's, <clears throat> it's built on top of Hadoop. It's basically an SQL engine, and it's translating the SQL to, to MapReduce. And it's really good at this. It's um, over the years, it's became really robust, it's mature, it's really the, the, the workhorse um, for it. And uh, it has the, the, the disadvantage, though, that it's quite slow and truly not interactive. And if you are a data scientist, if you want to come up with cool models, you, of course, want something that is fast and you want to iterate and try out new things. So it's not really the, the, the cool thing. But at that time, it was yeah, the, the, the go-to things, so the, the, the user preferences that we heard about um, in the first part of the talk, and the user segmentation were built with this because, of course, we are pragmatic. You, you use uh, what you have. And um, we were using the PyHive library. So if you want to use Hive, um, I can really recommend the PyHive library by Dropbox. It nowadays also has the Python th uh, 3 support. And... Um, so the question is, how did we actually use it? So I said it's an SQL engine, but um, of course we have seen we use some nice models, and you cannot really do cool uh, machine learning models only based on SQL. And you do this by using uh, user-defined functions. So 
what's the user defined function or a user defined aggregation function. So basically, you always need this when the native function of Hive or, or Spark or whatever aren't enough if you cannot express what you want to do as a composition of, of your native functions. And um, then you can define your, your own function. You should be aware that um, those uh, user-defined functions most of the time are much, much slower than the native ones. So use them only when you really have to. And um, yeah, they work on, on, on groups or sets of, of columns and group data. So you can imagine that's like if you do your group by and you say, okay, on those two um, columns, I want to do some operation and get the result back. So, um, I mean, most people surely know pandas. So just to, to get um, yeah, over to pandas, so to compare it, um, basically, user-defined functions, you can maybe separate in three kind of groups. You have like more like a transform like in pandas that you do really vector based on each uh, row. Uh, aggregation, this would be an SQL, a kind of group by and some aggregation functions. So you start off with a vector and you get only a single value. Or you can even be completely flexible like the apply function in uh, pandas that you get a vector in and you can completely decide if you get a smaller, larger vector or whatever out. So with this, we were, we were using uh, things like this for, for Hive, and, uh, but then we realized, okay, yeah, given the disadvantages of slow and you had to include this somehow in SQL, um, we were looking for alternatives. And like two years ago, it was really, Spark was a, or still is a big thing, but it really was a lot of hype around it. So we were looking at Spark and Spark is a fast and general processing engine for large data. I think all, many of people uh, know uh, Spark. It's uh, written in Scala, so of course this is uh, kind of the downside, so you cannot directly use it. Um, but of course there are nowadays um, um, good Python APIs for it, so Python is even declared uh, like a first class citizen for um, accessing Spark, and so together it's called PySpark, and uh, yeah, we were looking into this, this and decided, okay, that's the way for us to go. We can actually um, go and start migrating a lot of our use cases from Hive to Spark, and uh, yeah, get uh, then the many uh, benefits. So to show you one, so for instance, the user preferences uh, that we heard about. So um, we did a migration and. Uh, we had a, a lot of benefits. So first of all, we could dramatically reduce the lines of code. So we went from 2,500 lines of code to 1,700. And there, this also included new features. So this is actually would be a lower number if, if you would um, have stayed on the same feature set. Then, um, as I said before, so we were using um, kind of Jinja 2 to do some SQL queries. And this is really not a nice way. But Spark then allowed us to define queries in a much more um, programmatic kind of, of way. So it's much, much easier to define your queries. Also, we got rid of a lot of temporary tables. And this was also important, the, the runtime. So it's the runtime for this model, of course, you don't want to have your model run uh, four to 10 hours because you want to include the new data as fast as possible. And we could reduce it by just using Spark to one to two hours. So this is, uh, yeah, this interval is due to the fact how uh, the usage on, on the cluster is. For me, actually, one of the biggest gains was that um, the, the source code after the migration was much easier to understand. So um, for new employees and new team members, it was much easier to, to look at the Spark code and see, aha, that's happening there compared to uh, what we did in Hive. So uh, before I go a little bit more into uh, UDFs and the, the advantages and disadvantages of it, just to make sure that everyone understands how uh, Spark actually works. So in Spark, you have a kind of separation into a driver program. This is where you are kind of working in. This is where your Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebooks runs, your IPython kernel, whatever. And this process is orchestrating the, the worker nodes. So there the executors are running, and there is where the actually big data um, processing uh, takes place. And um, so, 
I said before, so we were using Python. So what happens actually if you call some, some Python user-defined function? So inside uh, a Spark worker, what, what, um, what Spark does is it's starting Python processes. And the data for the Python uh, process is then um, serialized, sent over to the Python process. It's deserialized, then your defined function is applied. It's serialized again, it's sent over over the, 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 the pipe, and the Spark worker is uh, deserializing it again, and, and there you are. So you already, by saying a lot of serializing and deserializing, going back and for forth, you see that this surely is a large overhead, and this actually makes up like 80, 90 percent of the actual processing is not happening in here in the, in the Python, um, um, Python module in your actually maybe machine learning model, but it's really happening in there, this going back and forth. And this is not only a problem that, um, that Spark ha has, this is actually a problem that a lot of tools has. Whenever you go from like one kind of library or one kind of world like Java, virtual machine to C and whatever back and forth, you have this for a lot of tools and actually um, this was recognized as being a major problem. So the guy, uh, Wes McKinney, the guy who, the inventor of Pandas said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something about it and came up with the with a Apache, Apache Arrow uh, library. And uh, this is a really hot topic now, so there later there's going to also be a, a talk about this, how you can use it to extend Pandas, so uh, with the help of Apache Arrow, so this is really um, an important thing. And it basically, so just a rough idea is that it, it kind of defines an abstract memory layout for your data, and whoever is using the same uh, layout does not need to do all this serialization, deserialization again to get the data into the right structures. So, luckily, Spark is using um, this in version 2.3. So, if you're lucky enough that you can use uh, Spark 2.3, so if your cluster is already updated f uh, uh, by the operation guy, you can use it, and then you have a really nice way of defining your uh, user-defined functions. You have this, this Pandas uh, UDF decorator, and here I do just some... Um, example, some cumulative distribution function, and you see that you can define this function with the help of a panda series, and uh, you then define, okay, here's my new column, and you just call this. And basically, um, what happens in the background is that um, the, the, the Java data is, um, is uh, then, by using pandas arrow, um, Copy it over to the um, to the to the Python process as a, a series, and there's no uh, serialization deserialization again. So there's directly this uh, panda series. You can also do this um, much uh, much in the same way with the same uh, flexibility as uh, pandas apply. So you can also easily define functions on whole data frames and decide um, yeah if you want to aggregate or uh, do whatever functions uh, you do. And this gives you a lot of flexibility. You can uh, also group by and do then something. So it's it's uh, really really cool, so uh, use definitely Python uh, and Spark 2.3 if you have the chance. And um, just to give you a rough idea of what kind of performance gains you would expect compared to the old way, old versions, there you see that um, for the, the CDF example, you have more than 200%, uh, 200 times, um, um, it's, it's faster, more than 200 times. So. The thing is, what is if you are not able to use um, Spark 2.3 because maybe your operation team hasn't yet updated the the the, the Hive cl uh, the, the, sorry Spark cluster or um, your distribution like Cloudera, Cloudera or Hortonwork hasn't yet uh, done um, the proper updates. So um, this is something we had to deal with in, in, in the past because, I mean, we've been doing the migration, uh, we had been doing the migration uh, like, like one and a half year ago, we finished this. So we had to come around um, with another way of defining really flexible UDFs and letting the data scientists define their function in, uh, with the help of pandas because uh, this is what, what people like. And uh, we came up with a nice solution 
um, with the help of going from the data frames back to the um, RDDs and using the map partition and then some, some um, decorators that we define so that you also can use uh, pandas. And it's a little bit more efficient than the, the, the traditional way, but of course not as good as uh, pandas udev. If you're also stuck with an older version of Spark, and you're interested, then uh, you can look this up. We wrote a little blog post about it, how you can actually use it. So another important topic is if you now have this flexibility of writing cool user-defined functions where you apply whole models, then you kind of want to use the power of Python. The power of Python really comes from the ecosystem. So meaning libraries like scikit-learn, uh, pandas, of course, scipy, stats model, and so on. And if you want to use this, you also want to make sure that you have the right, um, the right versions of those libraries installed. And this is quite easy if you're doing just normal Python. You do some virtual env or conda environment and so on. But with Spark, it's a little bit more complicated. You either can tell your operation team, so please roll out those versions, uh, those packages, those libraries with those versions on the whole cluster, or you give your data scientists like root access to the different executors, which is never a good idea. And um, of course, you also want to make sure that if there's an upgrade happening on your cluster, you don't will all your don't want all your applications to um, probably uh, stop working because they rely on an older version. So you want to keep this really tight to the uh, to the specific um, application. So this is also a technical challenge we had to deal with, and uh, we come up with a. Uh, I think quite nice solution because there's no uh, official solution yet. So people um, at Spark are working on this. Um, so we came up with the idea, so why not create a local environment based on wheels and upload those environment on HDFS because every data scientist, of course, is able to write in specific directories on HDFS. And then you can tell the driver process, so please distribute those files with the help of add file in Spark to the local memory of the executor's nodes. And if you then run your actual model or whatever you want to do on the Spark cluster, then it's using those libraries. And this allows you to really flexible per application define what libraries in which versions you want to use. So we also have written that, this down because this is really technical uh, in a nice uh, blog post to give you an overall idea how uh, it works. So normally, you, um, you start your, your productive um, uh, Spark jobs with the help of Spark Submit. And uh, what we now do is we have a called so-called activate environment uh, Python file. And what this basically does is it's telling the Spark driver, OK, here is somewhere uh, a virtual environment that um, the data scientist uh, already created uh, for you. And it's reading in those, um, those libraries in the, in the specific versions there um, in the driver. And this is distributing this on the, on the, on the Spark executors. And then um, the Spark executors, so, so then the, the, the driver process calls the actual program. So this is kind of pre-step. And then the actual uh, machine learning model or whatever is called and um, this can then use the libraries you defined here. And this uh, yeah, works uh, pretty well. And uh, yeah, for, for like, like one year, we, we are using this in production, so it works quite well. But of course, if there is uh, one day an official solution, we would rather also go for the official solution. So to, um, to summarize, we have, uh, we have seen that at eBay, there are many, many interesting challenging use cases that all have a high impact. It's a really data-driven company. We've um, heard uh, a lot about um, the data science parts in it, what kind of models we use, um, also some data engineering aspect aspects. Um, we, on the technical side, we use the PyData stack. We're really keen on, data, uh, on, on, on Python, uh, especially combined with uh, Hadoop and, and Spark. 
And uh, if you are now interested and say, well, cool, it's, it's ex exactly the kind of use cases I want to work on with the Python stack, then you are uh, really welcome to talk to us, our booth. We are also hiring, so eBay is hiring in Berlin. And yeah, I'm um, looking forward to hear from you. Thanks a lot. Thank you a lot. And of course, we're open for questions. <laughs> yeah, yes. we're open for questions, yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, as I understand, you have uh, some kind of recommender engine written in TensorFlow and uh, some data processing in uh, PySpark. So I wonder how do you integrate those? Uh, because uh, I just wonder if you integrate them somehow. Do you want to check that? Yeah. So, um, so the question was, uh, we have some things in, in PySpark for data transformations and so on. And um, other things like uh, our recommendation engine is uh, TensorFlow, and how do we combine all those? So um, we, we um, use uh, Jenkins for a lot of things to define the different uh, work steps. So I mean, in the talk before, we heard about Airflow. We were also looking into Airflow for uh, something like this. But actually, we're, yeah, we found out that for our needs, Jenkins was better, because you can also define your graph and what is happening there, and so on. So there are certain jobs that do our data ingestion, data um, transformations, and run some of the models then as user-defined functions and save them back in HDFS. So HDFS is kind of our yeah, kind of API sometimes for so jobs put stuff in new tables, create new petitions, and then another job comes and reads in the data again and does, for instance, uh, the recommendations. Um, or training the model. So actually, when the model is trained, then uh, the recommendations there, of course, um, they need to happen real time. And there, it's a completely another service. I mean, you train it from HDFS, but then it's running um, also on some kind of private cloud as a microservice. And the website is yeah, sending uh, REST requests to this uh, microservice. And TensorFlow serving is then um, yeah, answering um, the, and giving the, the replies with the, with the recommendations. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for the great talk. I have a question regarding the virtual environments you create on the executors. Yeah. You create those environments to uh, use Panda, uh, p um, to use Python libraries for machine learning, right? Yeah. Um, but how uh, do you manage to share the, the results between the executors? Because if you are training a model, um, I think you can't do this. Um, you, need, you need to aggregate somehow the results. Yeah, so I think it's like, like, are like two topics. So um, the virtual uh, environment or kind of the virtual environment is not created on the executor, it's created on HDFS, so like a single virtual environment. And then with the help of this uh, boilerplate code that we came up with, um, this, uh, if I switch back, um, this uh, activate environment, then the um, add file command of Spark is used to distribute it to the executors, but only in the, in the local um, in memory. So it only exists while the job are running, they get copies of the one virtual environment, which in HDFS. So it's only like, like in memory. And um, then um, the, the actual Spark um, job, I mean, there, of course, you have to uh, see how it, uh, yeah, how, how you partition your data to run your, uh, your model. If you, if you have a model that basically needs all the data at the same time, then of course you have a problem because your data re resides on one um, executor and some of another, but uh, many times, for instance, we split for different vehicle types, and um, yeah, some. It, it really depends on the model then how you partition uh, and split your data. 
Okay, oh, over here. Have you, um, because you showed you're working with the scikit-learn, have you looked at like distributed machine learning, or are you using this like um, the Spark ML lib, or the or H2O, for example? I'd say, yeah, actually, sorry. Both. Yeah, no, 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 go ahead. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. So um, we uh, we've also looked into Spark ML. So Spark ML, at least for the um, data products I'm working with, we haven't used it yet. No. Um, but uh, Yeah, it's. Um, I'm not sure if the quality is really so good. So there are many. So we talked to many people, tried out some things, and we were not really like you um, about uh, the results we had. And uh, so uh, we thought, okay, we rather stick with uh, Scikit Learn and uh, what we get there, and uh, also with H2O. So for yes, one, exactly, yeah. yeah, we have a lot. Of, we we actually using H2O most of the times because it's a very nice way to distribute between like the. Python, even R part, and our uh, serving layer, which is Java. So that was very successful so far. Many really quick follow up for that. So, how's that working, like the integration with like Spark and H2O? I actually didn't understand the question. The so, integration so of Spark and H2O. Like, how's it working? Not technically, how's it working, but is it working well, let's say? Yeah, I think it's a very good um, layer to. Like, okay, you can set it up e either on, on, on Python side, you put it in Spark, and then you learn your model. And the moment you have the data, you can like pretty much uh, use all the H2O libraries. And then you can directly serve it from there. So we're using Mojo files mostly um, to ship it then to production environment. And then you take it from there and serve it from the Java layer. Uh, it works. <laughs> it does. And it works fast. So that's. Uh, Will be around, I guess, yeah, we're actually just over there. If you come yeah. out, you're probably going to see us. Meet us, us at our booth. <laughs> Thanks. Again. Thanks.